In this video series, I'll be going over how to use supervised machine learning to do audio source separation. This is also commonly called audio enhancement. So the problem itself actually goes back to digital signal processing to a problem called uh, the cocktail party problem. And essentially you're at a party, you're, you're trying to have a conversation with someone, but it's very difficult to hear them because there's lots of interfering audio like music going on in the background. And so could we feed a mixture of audio to a neural network and actually supervise it such that it can recover the audio signal of interest? And that's what we're going to be doing in these videos. Uh, we'll be using something called Open Unmix. It's written in PyTorch. And what I've done here is I've taken uh, 10 podcasts from the Joe Rogan experience and I've kind of randomly mixed this into another data set called ESC50, which is really just a bunch of environmental noises that we'll use as our interfering audio. And so I guess um, in this video, we'll be going over the initial results of what you can expect. So we'll have some demos of listening to what this sounds like in practice. And at the end, I'll talk a little bit about the neural network architecture and why kind of all of this works. It's, it's actually very simple. And so uh, let's actually go over here. So for those who don't know, this is something called a spectrogram. So on the top here, I have, uh, this is actually Andrew Yang talking for about two seconds. And then at the bottom, this is uh, a chainsaw. And so uh, this is a spectrogram where if you have a time series signal, you can do something called the, uh, the short time Fourier transform, which will convert from a time domain to a frequency domain. So at the top, we have low frequency content of the signal. As we go uh, up here in the y-axis, this would be high frequency. And on the x-axis, we have time. And so our neural network will be taking in a mixture of audio, and it will be producing a ratio mask. And the ratio mask is just values from zero to one. And so when we multiply our mixture by a ratio mask, we can actually recover the signal of interest. And so we can, we can decompose not only into the podcast audio, but we can decompose into the interfering audio. And what, what makes this kind of difficult and why we're using neural network in the first place is because it's often common that we have overlapping uh, frequencies in both our signal of interest and our interferer. And that's what makes it very difficult. Now, the neural network's not great at doing this, but it does it better than any other approach that's currently available. So let's actually take some time to take a look at the results here. So what we're looking at here is a box plot of the signal distortion ratio over all the classes from the ESC50 dataset. So if you actually go over to the Open Unmixed Repositories main page, um, you'll see graphs like this, but the target will be for like vocals or bass because uh, Open Unmix was originally built for decomposing music into those sources. So, but the SDR that they kind of report is the average is around like six or seven if you take a look at their box plots. And that's about what you're seeing here. Uh, so the classes at the top, like crickets or rooster or a, a clock ticking, in these cases, oftentimes the audio that's interfering happens at a very different frequency than um, the audio of interest, the podcast. So it's very easy to separate them and we get a really high SDR. And there are some cases at the bottom here, like chainsaw and airplane where uh, over time what you'll see is there's lots of activity happening um, at every single different frequency like a low to a high frequency and it makes it very difficult to actually separate the people talking from the noise right and i have some examples of this in the next slide all right so i've got some examples here from the bob lazar podcast and so let's take some time to listen to these samples. So first we'll just start with just the podcast audio. 
happened. The craft took off and then came flying at us, stopped, you know, turned at a right angle, flew back. And then, you know, after it did some, you know, amazing stuff we like, to get the camera. And then you know, we started filming. So it doesn't have all of it on there. It just has some. The way um, I describe it to my friends and they said, what does this look like? I said, take a laser pointer and then have a wall and then move it around the wall. Like, you know how it moves around yeah. the wall? It doesn't seem like it has anything to do with inertia. Okay, so now we're going to listen to um, five different interference classes, so five seconds each. Um, so that first class was, I'll just tell you what the classes were. They were crickets, um, an airplane. The middle one was some kind of bird. Uh, four was a siren. And the last one was a uh, crackling fire. So um, we would actually expect good performance from uh, three of those. And then the poor performers would be the airplane and the siren. So let's actually listen to the prediction that the neural network makes. Up and the craft took off and then came flying at us, stopped, you know, turned at a right angle, flew back, and you know, did some amazing stuff. And you know, we started filming, so it doesn't have all of the money, it just has some. And then I described it to my friends and I said, What is it? Like? I said, Take a laser pointer and then have a ruler and then move it around the wall. Like, you know how it moves around yeah. the wall? It doesn't seem like it has anything to do with inertia. Okay, so. Hopefully you saw like a contrast of what happens when you have like in the case of crickets, you probably have a lot of frequencies that aren't op overlapping with people talking. So you get performance that sounds really good. Whereas when you get something like an airplane that kind of invades the entire frequency, like a whole range of frequencies, it makes it very difficult. Um, but, uh, you know, is it, a production level kind of result not really but oftentimes this can be used to uh, do some pre-processing if you're trying to do further machine learning on your audio like you're just trying to get a improved signal before you run classification on it this is one way to do it um, and so I'll talk a little bit about like in essence this is we can take a look at some examples like in the interference here, we have lots of low frequency noise, and it kind of shows up within the prediction. And then, uh, I guess at a higher frequency, this podcast has some high frequency that isn't present in the interference, and it does a very good job filtering that. So, what you're kind of left with is a, a fairly high performing filter that can act at every single frequency range, which is actually quite impressive. So, uh, and what, what I have up here is when you guys take the short time Fourier transform, um, the parameters that I use are NFFT, so uh, 512, so the number of points within your Fourier transform um, when you actually go to compute the frequency. And then you'll move this energy along as so you would hop along the signal 160 points, you recompute that, and then you kind of stack up. All these energies over time and that's how you actually get uh, the short time Fourier transform to take a signal from the time domain to the frequency domain and then obviously once we multiply by our ratio mask we can take the inverse short time Fourier transform to get and recover our signals completely so now let's take a look at architecture so here we have the open unmix architecture and you guys can actually head over to their github page and check it out but um, I'll kind of be explaining what happens at every layer of this architecture. So um, we're going to be actually feeding in time series signals. And if you do choose, you can also feed in pre-computed spectrograms. But, you know, either way, uh, the way I did this is we'll use time series and the spectrogram will be computed internally. And then there's a cropping step. So our audio and most audio is sampled at 44.1 kilohertz. Um, but oftentimes what happens is there's some 
high frequency content that we're not necessarily interested in like normally not anything happens at the higher frequencies so to get better resolution on our audio we're going to crop it and this is pretty much equivalent to down sampling your audio now there is a normalization step where uh, for each frequency bin within your spectrogram they will be normalized so they will have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one now what's different from this architecture from some other ones that I've seen is normally at this point most people use convolution layers and they kind of stack them up and they take up a lot of memory um, before in order to like compute relevant features to go into an LSTM unit uh, this architecture is a little different because it does compression so again a lot of times only certain frequencies are important so what they do is here is they actually compress based on the audio channel which that's why you see a 2 here that's referring to stereo audio um, we're actually going to be using mono audio so it doesn't really matter um, but this number is probably the frequency bin so what they do is they let uh, these weights and this activation function kind of learn what frequencies are actually important to feed into the LSTM. Um, there's a lot of batch normalization in this network because uh, a lot of times the gain between audio signals will vary a lot and so batch normalization is generally just really helpful in bringing everything down to the same scale. Now they have a hyperbolic tangent because we probably have lots of negative values because we zero meaned our data. And at this point, we've learned some relevant features to go into a bi-directional LSTM. So uh, pretty much you're always going to be using a bi-directional LSTM as opposed to just a forward one. Uh, and that's because when you actually listen to audio, it turns out that neural networks, when you let uh, them listen to the audio forwards and backwards, as in most cases, it gives context on what's going on. Like, it's pretty hard to make predictions in a forward manner, but if you also can listen to the audio backwards, you get more context and you get more accurate predictions. So it seems kind of weird. It's something that a human would never do, but in this case, it actually boosts performance. And oftentimes, like, they have a skip connection here. So if you're familiar with ResNet, um, it's where you will allow the features that we learned earlier in the network to be uh, kind of used later on. So even if we want to kind of remember what happened before the cells TM unit, we concatenate those onto the output. And this is a, a three-layer deep LS TM, which is about, I've seen it in a couple of other publications, so you can play around with that. They have a variable that lets you change this. And then you just feed through uh, you know, standard fully connected layers until you uh, rescale your output and you pass through a ReLU. So again, the ratio mask is scaled but from zero to one. So that's why you can pass through a ReLU because its output is zero through one. And at this point, you will recover your ratio mask. And all we have to do is multiply by the original mixture spectrogram to produce the targets. Now there is one step that they didn't show here and that is the they use what's called a Weiner filter and I'm not going to go into it you know feel free to read up on it but essentially given certain spectrogram components that are predicted you can also use the mixture spectrogram um, to do something which is called like expectation maximization to produce an even cleaner estimate in the target often so um, they are using a Weiner filter I just felt like I should mention it, even though they don't show it here. So now let's take a look at some system requirements that you'll need on your computer before we start running all this stuff. So I'm going to be doing all this in Ubuntu 18.04. Um, generally, when you do machine learning, doing things in Linux is very helpful. Um, however, if you guys are using Windows or Mac, um, don't let that deter you. A lot of the stuff that we're going to be running uh, should run just fine. There just might be some like minor hiccups that might happen in some of the scripts we're writing, and I'll I'll kind of mention that as we go along. Um, but if you want to use a Google Colab notebook because you don't have access to a GPU, that's probably fine. 
it's just probably going to be very slow because of how Google Colab Notebooks kind of run in the first place. And you'll need about 20 gigabytes of disk space because that's about the size of audio I used. You can use something much higher if you'd like, but that's up to you. And the nice thing about this architecture is it's fairly small, so you can run with as little as like four gigabytes of memory, which is actually quite nice. And obviously it should support all the CUDA libraries. Uh, we'll also be using FMPEG, so um, all FMPEG is being used here for is like converting MP3s into waves. So if you're on Windows and you can't run FMPEG from command line, you can, I'll point it out at certain points, and you can just convert MP3s to wave with some kind of software if you like. Um, and we'll use Anaconda for package management, pretty standard stuff with Python. So yeah, I um, hope you guys like this video. In the next few videos, we'll be actually getting into the programming. I'll see you then.